Hello, this is a video uh, for April session. And in this video, we're going to be working on the use of first language in second language learning. Now, should the English teachers use Portuguese, that is the mother tongue, to teach English? So there are different beliefs and we are going to be working on those beliefs on how much first language or mother tongue should be present in the second language learning situation. And we are going to be working on the beliefs and also we're going to be working on a new study that is on the trans language in pedagogy. So let's see, which are the beliefs of using mother tongue in the classroom, in the language classroom? For example, the translation should be banned, right? No translation allowed in the classroom. This is one of the beliefs. And sometimes it is really important that translation doesn't happen, but not always, and we'll see that. Uh, it might happen as well that if the learners speak in L1, they will never learn English. This is, that's another belief. And I would say that sometimes when the learners are really enthusiastic or when they have a poor command of a second language, or when they are very young, they need to speak in L1, right? To uh, accomplish a task or an activity. So it happens that maybe it's not that relevant if they every now and then switch to the mother tongue, in your case, to Portuguese. Another belief is if a teacher speaks only English, the learners do not understand. That is a very common belief among parents that parents have this let's say, um, double double uh, feeling that if the teacher speaks only English, the learners don't understand. But if the teacher uses Portuguese, the learners will not acquire the second language. So the thing is to keep a balance. And of course, the more English is spoken in the, class, in the classroom, the better, if the learners can follow what the teacher is saying. So we need to keep a balance here. My child needs to have a translation to understand. So another belief from the parents, uh, if you don't translate, they don't get it. Children will get it. And we have to trust that they will get it because it, it will happen. We need to insist and help, right? That the children understand what we are saying through body language, through miming, and sometimes a quick switch to the mother tongue and I come back very quickly to English again will help them get you know the, the, the knowledge, the, the understanding, and then move on to what the teacher is saying next. Learners should have a list of vocabulary translated into L1. This is a very old belief, and nowadays we prefer to have the vocabulary list with a drawing or it's something that conveys the meaning, but it's not the word in Portuguese. For, for, for the English word. So it's better if they don't have a translation there. But again, it, we need to keep a balance here. And many times it's better to have a drawing or a picture or something than to have the word in Portuguese. So what about translation? Is it really important? Is it that the children don't understand the second language if they don't translate to the first language? Okay, in the case of Translation, there are some things that are really good. For example, if we need to explain a concept that is quite difficult, uh, a word that is quite difficult in, in English and the children don't have a very good command of the language, maybe it's better to give the word in Portuguese so that they get it and they go back to English. Another good thing that has a uh, translation has is that many times they are words that are quite similar in English and Portuguese. So they can make a sort of association of, of meaning and they might remember that. So there are some things that are good, right, about translation, but there are others that are, should not be taken into consideration. For example, many times the teachers have a feeling that the learners do, don't understand. So they always translate instructions, for example. They explain the instructions in English then they explain them again in Portuguese. And so what happens here is, is that the learners will not make the effort to understand English because they know later will come the explanation in Portuguese. 
So what we are doing here is just keeping those learners without making the effort and window, without trying to get the knowledge they need and grasp the meaning and understand the instructions. So it's better if we make the effort to keep as, a, as much uh, English as possible during the class and try to stop the learners to getting used to um, wait for the translation of whatever is said in the classroom. Many times the children translate what we say. We give a short instruction and they translate. This is what they need to do in order to confirm that they have understood. In this case, we can tell the children, okay, you can say that to me here silently, but don't say to the whole class because the others are already working and they don't need a translation to understand. So if you need to check your understanding with the translation, it's okay, but do it to me silently. Now, which is the learning a process of a, of a second language, the natural learning process. So the first thing they do is we have a sort of home language use. We have this common language, classroom language that we call that learners understand and they get it. And they, they understand beautifully to what is said to sit down, stand up, open your books, because we help that with our minding, right? And then the child will go through a nonverbal period that they will be just listening and recording, right? And making meaning of what we are saying and how the language works. After that silent period or nonverbal period, the children will start producing some language, but formal like or telegraphic language. For example, those dialogues they memorize because every day we say the same thing. Hello, how are you? What's the weather like today? It's sunny, it's windy. So they get that. And after those formulaic and telegraphic use, they start the production of the language. So it will take some time for the learners to start producing language. So we try, should try not to be too anxious about production, right? We need to be a bit more anxious on other aspects that we'll deal with that later in, in future videos, but the production can wait. And there is then this um, study of translanguaging that I told you we were uh, going to address. And so what is translanguaging? It's not translating, but is the use of the knowledge the learners have, they already have on one language, to use that knowledge on how a language works to learn the second language. And many times we find when they start talking, when they start working, when they are in, in the very spare stages of the language acquisition, that they use a sort of mixed word um, sentence. And so they're going to be using, uh, constructing a sentence half in English and half in Portuguese, and it's okay. They're going to, in a, in a sentence that, it, in English, let's say, they're going to insert some words in Portuguese. And the way around, you will see that when they speak Portuguese, they will come up some words in English. That is a normal process of a bilingual learner. So we should not worry about this, this is normal, but apart from being normal, we can accept it in the classroom and help them construct their knowledge from their own. So translanguaging is also a way of teaching. It's a pedagogy that allows children, for example, to read in one language and then discuss in another language, right? Or read in one language and then write something about that in another language. So they can come and go from one language to the other naturally. This might happen even without noticing. The learners will not be aware they are doing this thing. And I know that some parents say, oh, he's mixing all the languages up. It's okay. It's a normal process of bilingual learners. So when we move to translanguaging to allow this to happen in our classrooms, there's studies that sustain that this might be a natural phenomenon, right? And we might use this with pedagogical strategies in the classroom. So it's good for you as teachers to know that this might happen and it's a normal process. So teachers are not stressed out, you know, to use only English in the classroom. So. How do you help this second language acquisition? We need to help our teachers become more proficient and therefore we need to offer them professional development. A professional development that will enrich 
right? That will expose uh, the learners to reach well-pronounced, fluent, accurate English language models. So if our teachers are good models, the learners will learn much better. So professional development will promote collaboration, will be supported and differentiated, right? Differentiated, that means that every teacher will have the kind of professional development she or he actually needs, right? To move on and become more proficient, relevant, that is not a professional development on whatever, it's a professional development situation moment on something that teachers actually need at that moment. Includes hands-on because the teachers are not going to be sitting there just listening to things. They need to put that into practice and know how to bring all that knowledge to the classroom. So they need to have hands-on professional development. And this professional development should add on to their knowledge, to the background knowledge. So we need to know how much do teachers know about a certain topic before offering professional development on that certain area. Professional development should promote reflection, personal reflection, personal assessment, right? Self-assessment and should be sustained over time. Many times schools offer professional development in let's say February and then for the rest of the year, nothing. And what they learned in February, uh, they will start losing motivation to, to use it and apply that knowledge later on. So there needs to be a sort of follow up for professional development, right? To be sustainable. So in order to support the second language learning in your schools, you need to allow teachers and learners to use Portuguese when necessary and for a very short period of time. Of course, we need to ask teachers to use English as much as possible. And we need to be sure that teachers are great models of of the language and help teachers develop invited atmospheres for learners to accept the challenge to use English in class and not feel, you know, unsure, uncertain, ashamed, right? Then you need to support teachers in the application of French language in pedagogy so they feel at ease at allowing some L1 mother tongue come up. And so, just to remember, the communication comes first and the grammar second. So first we need to ask the learners to be able to communicate. And later on in upper grades, they will learn the grammar of the language. But what we need to focus on at the beginning is how they communicate. Vocabulary and appropriate uh, pronunciation develop their frequent use, meaningful exposure and high quality models of language. So this is what we need to focus on now. And high proficiency comes from progressively complex use of the language over time. So we need to enrich the context where the learners will be working on. All right. And so remember, which is the process, the natural process as a language learner goes through. And the professional development, you need to offer the teachers to keep them updated and really professional. Some further reading links for you to keep on developing on this area. Thank you.